little microphone. Yeah. All right, so we are ready to roll and I just accidentally muted everybody. So Joseph, you could unmute yourself. I did. All right, thank you. And we are recording. Hopefully you can see my screen. That one over there. <laughs> yeah, looks great. OK, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be watching Teams, although there's no chat functionality, so I can't see anything. But feel free to interject at any point. It's rather informal. It should take anywhere from 45 to 50 minutes, maybe an hour, depending on if there's questions or how fast I speak. If any questions, feel free to reach out. Same at the end. Either case, uh, you know, Jim makes it sound like I'm in trouble. No one really calls me Joseph anymore, except for my mother when I was in trouble. Uh, but it's on all my quote unquote official things. Most people call me Joe. At work, they call me Joe G because my last name is hard to pronounce. But anyway, call me Joe G, call me Joe. Anything but my full name, which is Joseph Guadagno. <laughs> Here's my contact information. I'm available. My camera go off? Yeah, I turned off my camera. If you need my camera on, just let me know. But, you know, PowerPoint's the important part now. Uh, do, 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 do. Can you hear me? It says that someone else started sharing. Uh, yes, we can hear you. And it looks like Patty is sharing. Patty, can you uh, let Joseph take over? <laughs> I mean, I didn't even get past the intro slide and you guys turned me off already. That's just rude. Yep. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Totally fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just over share over Patty. I, I think she hit a wrong button somewhere along yeah, the line. It's no worries. It wouldn't be a user group or a presentation of mine without some sort of failure. Actually, when I gave this at Granite City, I gave the first three slides and found that I was on mute. So we're off to a better start this time. At least you can see the first slide. <laughs> Uh, my contact information is here for you. Feel free to reach out on email or on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter, a lot around technology, sometimes some personal stuff. I blog about a lot of the topics I talk about, which is the first URL, jjg.me slash about jjg. And I also stream three times a week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays at typically... 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time at jjg.me slash stream. There'll be a couple of links that will be available throughout the talk. Uh, all those start with https colon forward slash forward slash jjg.me. So you only have to write down the last part if you're taking any notes. But if you go to my site that's listed there, the slides are already there with lots of notes and details inside if you want to take it and look at it. A little bit about me. I am a director of technology at Quicken Loans. I lead three different teams as part of you know what we do. The teams consist of engineers, business analysts, quality engineers, et cetera. Uh, I organize an event similar to the Granite City Code Camp called Desert Code Camp, which happens in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, once a year, typically in the October timeframe, we kind of skipped it this year because of you know, lots of reasons. We weren't as brave as Jim was with Granite City. Um, I'm a Microsoft Developer Services MVP. What that means is I do a lot of work for Microsoft for free, but I am not a Microsoft employee or as better known as a blue badge. I'm a Telerik Ninja, but also the more important stat, father to husband to one. Although sometimes all three of them would wish for otherwise. So a little bit about the agenda. Today, we're gonna kind of walk through where we were within the Microsoft stack of software development, then talk about the transition to .NET Core, and then kind of take a look at where we are now, and then where we're going 
and the feature, and then what that really means for what .NET is now ish. And the reason why the ish is in parentheses is because there's some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in the slides that parts of it are being introduced in .NET 5, but they're not really generally available. So we started off with .NET Framework back in January of 2002, which seems like a really long time ago. And it kind of was. It's 18 years ago, actually almost 19 now, when .NET first came out. And then version 2 was introduced in a good three years later. And then probably one of the bigger releases was .NET 3. And then .NET 3.5, which introduced Link, Dynamics, and a bunch of other things. I think Link was the biggest back in August. So it took almost six years for a couple of versions. We then had version 4 in two years after that. And then version 4.5, or the final-ish version, back in August. That led Microsoft to start to rethink and reevaluate what they meant by, you know, what they want to do from a software developer standpoint. So if you take a, take a trip down memory lane to the 2010s, you know, 2010, 2013, and so on, these two guys were famous for commercials. Uh, there was a age old debate at the time between Microsoft and Apple as to which one was better, which one was cooler, which one was more hip. I think the commercials had the Microsoft guy being the guy on the left with the tie and everything, and the Mac guy being the guy on the right with you know the kind of cool, young, hip. So there was a lot, it was a lot more to the world than just a Windows desktop. There were Mac desktops, Windows phones, uh, Apple phones, Android phones started to make a dent in the market. There was a lot of different ways. Microsoft wanted to tap into that to some extent, and they couldn't do that with .NET Framework. So we had this guy that came along in June of 2018, or sorry, 2016. That's when Microsoft introduced the .NET Core framework. And the reason I pause perfectly or specifically in between the word .NET Core and framework is it was more of a development platform. We wrote our first console right line, hello world, and welcomed this little guy into the world. Now, the purpose of .NET Core was a lot of things. This is Microsoft's really first attempt at moving into the open source world. Dynet Core was introduced as open source where anyone can contribute to it. But you know that was one of the side deals. The real main reason for it was they wanted a platform that can run on something other than Windows. They wanted Windows-based developers or developers that used to build on Windows platform to be able to build on Macs and Linux operating systems and pretty much anything that was out there. So .NET Core was created there. It was meant to be more modern, have new modern programming uh, methodologies in it, like asynchronous, uh, better memory management, better performance, and be consistent. And also realize that you know most of .NET Framework is all UI based. If you didn't have Visual Studio, you really couldn't work well within the Microsoft ecosystem. So they wanted a command line based thing to start attracting in other developers that were popular in the Ruby world or Python world or other worlds. So as a result of .NET Core, Microsoft had .NET Framework there, now, Microsoft, now .NET Core, they needed something to help bridge the gap. And that's where .NET Standard came in. .NET Standard, the official definition is a formal specification of .NET APIs that are intended to be available on all .NET implementations. That's a lot of words to just really say. The intent was to be able to provide a way 
to bridge the gap between .NET Framework and .NET Core. So you can build an app in core and reference framework components or vice versa, build something in framework that uses core components. And what I mean by components like packages, like a logging framework or you know controls like a teller or control. But that became kind of cumbersome. If you ever did any dealings with .NET standard, you ended up with something like this. This is the .NET standard compatibility matrix, which if you like Excel, you're probably like, sweet, this rules. But if you were a component developer, you had to do a lot of looking at things to kind of see where you fit in. So if you look at this top row here, that says .NET standard 101112, blah, blah, blah. Those were the different, or not were, they still are the different versions of .NET standard. So you'd look at this list across the top and then you come down the side saying, these are the different frameworks that .NET Core works with. It works with .NET, or sorry, that .NET standard works with. It works with .NET Core, .NET Framework, Mono, Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Mac, Xamarin Android, Universal Windows Platform, Unity. So if you were a component vendor or someone writing a library, like let's say NUnit or JSON, Newtonsoft JSON or Telerik Control and you wanted broad reach, you had to look at this guy to see where you had to build on. So these component guides or these version numbers up top indicated what level of APIs you had accessible. So at the version 1.6, you had access to let's say 500 APIs. Those can be things like system.io, system.web, et cetera. And then you were guaranteed support at minimum for .NET Core version 1.0 and up in .NET framework for six and up and so on. You would have to go down this list. So you knew if you needed a component or a piece of .NET standard in 2.1, you pretty much lost support for anything below in .NET Core 2.0, You couldn't do anything for .NET Framework, Mono, you had to be 6.4 and up. So it became kind of cumbersome to say the least. So where are we now? If, you, if you're looking at the software development landscape, there's lots of different things. And I'm just talking about Microsoft development in general. You have .NET Framework as an option. You have .NET Standard as an option. And some of these options you have to work with together. You have .NET Core, you have Xamarin, you have Mono, you have React Native if you want to build mobile apps. You have Ionic, another way to build mobile apps. Or you can have Electron to build something cross-platform that can work on the web or work on a desktop, work on a Mac, work on your phone. Or you have Unity if you're building game development, if you're doing game development. Those are nine different things or nine different platforms you as a software developer would have to know in order to kind of really be successful in the, the Microsoft world or to be able to build for the platforms. If you look at what we're building apps for now, we have desktop, we have web, we have cloud, we have mobile, gaming, IoT, AI. We have so many different things that, we're, that we need to build apps for. And that's a lot. Looking at our previous slide, oops, looking at our previous slide, these nine things with these seven things, it's kind of hard. Microsoft wants .NET to be that platform to help you build apps across all these things. So you don't have to work and learn React. You don't have to go and learn uh, something special for IoT. You don't have to learn Unity for gaming. You have one framework that it is smart enough to do what's needed for the others. So what does that mean for the .NET framework? Is it dead? It's the age old question for all of us engineers. You know, it's Silverlight. You know, there was a long debate for two years whether Silverlight was 
was dead, whether Visual Basic is dead, you know, what have you. And long answer is yes, it sort of is dead, but at the same time, it's not really dead. And the reason why it's not really dead, it's dead, but it's not dead. So it's dead as far as Microsoft is not building any new APIs in it. They will release service packs for security issues and things like that, but you're not gonna get any net new functionality built on it. But it's not dead in the same that your .NET Framework applications are gonna be safe because the .NET Framework right now is distributed as part of the Windows operating system. So as long as Windows 10 or Windows 7 is supported, your .NET Framework applications will still work. It doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, should stay on them forever. There should be a migration path, but you got a ways to go before. And like I said, no new APIs are going to be built. So what does that mean about .NET standard? Well, this one's Kind of iffy. It's sort of broke, sort of dead, but sort of not dead. It still needs to be there to leverage between now .NET, .NET Core, and .NET Framework. So it's going to be there for a bit. But again, no new APIs are going to be built. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. .NET Standard is going to be used to share code. And you can read more about it at the .NET underscore standard link. The uh, .NET standard PM emo does a really good job of explaining it in, in this blog post. So the general guidance is you're gonna use .NET standard 2.0 to communicate between .NET framework and anything else. So that means core, Xamarin, et cetera. If you are working with Mono, Xamarin, or .NET Core 3X and up, you pretty much want to target 2.1. So if you know you need to work with .NET Framework, target .NET Standard 2.0. If you're interacting with Mono, Xamarin, or .NET Core 3X, target 2.1. Going forward, that means we're going to use .NET 5. 0 for code sharing. And the 5.0 is what they call the TFM or target framework moniker. You, know, you saw in the previous post, .NET Standard 2.0, .NET Standard 3.0. Now it's .NET 5. There will be some variations of it going forward, but for the most part, that's what you need to know. So what does that mean? What's the vision of .NET? So there's going to be a single SDK now. You want, remember a couple of slides back, you want that one SDK that can go and work on a mobile, work on a desktop, work and solve your AI problems, work on your IoT device, et cetera. Also want a cross-platform native UI. We're going to touch on this in a couple of slides. Want to, they want it to be a cross-platform web UI where you can run this and it can run on multiple, uh, work in multiple browsers like Blazor does and other things where you as a developer shouldn't worry about that. You write the code, it figures out how to run it elsewhere. Want to be cloud native out of the box. Right now, the cloud stuff is all add-ons with SDK, but you're going with the cloud first mentality. And that doesn't mean all your code has to run on the cloud, but how you deploy your code should not matter to the code you actually write. Speed and size are a huge uh, chunk of it. If you've seen any of the blog posts or any of the talks from uh, Granite City Code or .NET Conf, you see that there is a lot of talk about that and i'll cover some of that in some of the slides upcoming and then instrumentation improvement they've really worked on this a lot in addition to the speed and size how often do you get an app that's quote unquote legacy which nowadays means it was built two weeks ago uh, 
that you had to support and have no idea when it's running. There's a bug that happens. You get an error email and you're like, I have no idea what to do with this. We're working on ways to do a lot of instrumentation built into the framework. So even if you inherit those uh, quote unquote legacy apps that you won't need to know about it. So how did they plan on implementing this vision? Let's take a look at the schedule and you can read more about it at the URL below. So we had .NET Core 3.1, which is a long-term support, which is the LTS that came out in December, 2019. Long-term support means that they are supporting that version until three years after the next major version comes out, if I got the terminology correct. And again, you can read more about it here. So a couple of days ago, I think it was a week ago today, what's today? No, a week ago yesterday, .NET was released. We had .NET 5, which is not, as you can see here, long-term support, which means it technically is not supported after the next long-term support release comes out. So once.NET 6 comes out in November of 2021, that'll be the next long-term support, which means .NET 5 at that point will not be supported, which is why .NET Core 3.0 is not supported. And then .NET 7 will come out in 2022, November, and then .NET 8. What you notice here is all the even numbers of .NET are the long-term support. So it means every two years, there's going to be a long-term support release. So if you write an app and deploy it on .NET 6, you can guarantee that that will be supported till for the next uh, five years, if my math is correct, until three years from when this comes out. And they're doing a more... Um, predictive schedule as far as when things are coming out. They're going to guarantee-ish that a new release will come out every year, and they're just going to build upon it. They've made some pretty significant efforts to have zero to no, zero to very, very, very limited changes when it comes to release to release. And I just did a stream last week updating my granted relatively small ASP MVC 3.1 after .NET 5 and it, everything worked instantly. And honestly, it was a lot faster too. So let's look at what .NET 5 is. It's really the start of the unification. This is where Microsoft is saying, okay, we're really committing to this and gonna go in full blast to this overall vision of having .NET be the one platform for desktop, web, cloud, mobile, gaming, IoT, and AI. So where do we start with that? Ooh. Right. So what does that mean? So you'll see these TFMs, or like I said, target framework monikers that kind of indicate where they are. So .NET 5 will have the moniker of 5.0, and then you'll see .NET 5.0-Windows. Now these are APIs that are specific for running on Windows. So if you're doing any WinForm stuff, that's it. But you notice that in the .NET 6, there's an Android and iOS and Windows. These will have specific libraries to move forward with the um, UIs for that. So Project MAUI, as you may or may not have heard of, is Microsoft's um, framework or project to unify all the different user interface experiences. I mean, right now there's Blazor, there's WinForms, there's WebForms, there's MVC, there's uh, Xamarin Forms, there's Xamarin Apps. In general, they're trying to combine all these into one framework and then the framework will decide how to do that work and going forward you'll see those addendums that get added if you're looking to target something specific there will be build and release numbers out so like for android 
you might want to target something that's specific to the Google 29 API. So there'll be a .NET 6.0-Android-29 port, so to speak, and the same thing in the Windows world. You notice I keep using the term .NET because they have gotten rid of the word core from it and the word uh, framework from it. They're trying to have one programming for it. It's really hard to say it without using the word framework, but .NET is the way going forward. And the reason why they jumped to five and not just did .NET Core 4, .NET 4 was because they didn't want to confuse .NET 4, the new version with any of the 4.x framework versions. So going forward, you'll only hear .NET 5, 6, 7, et cetera. With the exception of ASP.NET, ASP.NET is still keeping the core mentality or the core moniker to it because the ASP.NET has branding and the core has the you know, faster branding for it. So what are we starting with? Actually, quite a bit, and I'm going to cover over the next couple of slides some of the highlights of .NET 5. And these are going to be some 25,000 foot views. We'll do some code, but not a lot. So one of the major features introduced was the record types. Record types, to me, kind of got confusing, and I read a couple of different things and played around with them. And if you read the official definition, which is on this screen, essentially I think of record types as a way to uh, have a class. It's kind of like a hybrid of a structure and a class. Uh, you can think of record types as shortcuts around classes that don't have a lot of methods. They're used primarily for data transfer objects. So if you just want to do something like a person that has a first name, last name, and email, that's a great example, but you don't want a thing like, uh, what's their full name and uh, save this person, et cetera. So they're really good for transferring objects. Think of them as like post uh, body objects. Uh, so let's take a look at one of them. Here's a sample person that has a first name, last name, and a constructor. Now, the constructor might look a little weird in line uh, six, but essentially we're declaring a, a person that has a first name and last name. And then we use the lambda syntax here to say, take the first name and last name and use the first name and last name from in here. So that's the equivalent of us typing in uh, bracket lower, uh, first name, uh, capital F, capital N equals lowercase first, semicolon, last name, capital L, capital N equals lowercase last. So saves a couple of keystrokes. Then you look at it, it supports inheritance also. So now I have a teacher that is of type person, although I'm pretty sure some of the teachers I had were not really people, that they were aliens of some sort, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, you can add to the person by declaring a subject, and then you get the same kind of um, constructor syntax for it. You notice it. One of the things you'll notice in a lot of the samples is uh, Microsoft is trying to remove a lot of the ceremony, as they put it, with getting things ready, trying to make the, the compiler smart enough to figure out what you want. Then you have this student class that is sealed, or sorry, student record that's sealed that runs the same way. So you have a lot of the same uh, functionality that a class has without a lot of the ceremony to it. Uh, but where it really benefits is the next thing. So one of the things with records is uh, records are what Mads, the uh, language designer for C-sharp 9, likes to say is value semantics. 
it's all about the values there. So in the past, like if you were comparing online for where you're trying to see if a person is equal to a teacher, in our example here, it doesn't equal. But if you took out the teacher of being C sharp on line two and just had a person with the name of Joe Guadagno and a teacher with the name of Joe Guadagno and not a subject, if you compare it if they were equal, they would be equal because it shows uh, they had the same values. They also introduced something called positional records. So if you look at the declaration here on a person record, we have, uh, actually, let's go back here to the person record. You have a first name, last name, and then this long string in line six. It is something called positional records, which can do a lot of that semantics. So cut out that three line thing. So if you look at line two, where it says person record, or sorry, public record, person, string, first name, last name, it'll automatically behind the scenes create for you a record which has a public get and set property for first name and a public get and set property of last name. And then for line four, a teacher do the same thing. Create a teacher that inherits from person that has a first name, last name, and subject. So now we cut that seven line example here. Granted, there are some spaces in there to a one line statement. So again, let the compiler do the smart work and not have a lot of the ceremony behind it. Another big feature that was added was init only setters. Now this one I really like for a couple of different reasons. The first and primary reason is it makes the code a lot cleaner and gets rid of some unnecessary stuff. So you're probably wondering what it is. And the easiest way to explain it is to show an example. So here we have a struct. It could be a class, could be a record. It doesn't really matter. Um, or if you look at line three, there is a public date time property called date of birth, which has a getter and something called init. What this tells a compiler is that this date of birth can only be set upon object initialization. So if I do my if I do a new new person, which you'll see on the next slide, that's the only time I can set the person of this class. And that cuts out a lot of things where if you have to have a public property where you override the get to see if it's already set or override it in the constructor to figure out if it's already been set. Now you have the init, and it means this code like this lines one through five, and pardon me if you hear my dog barking. On lines one through five, I am creating a new instance of this person, Joe Guadagno, who has a date of birth of May 1st in 2020. And though, although it may feel like that in COVID years, I am a little bit older than uh, six months old. And you see on line seven, I try to update that to 2000, but we'll end up getting a compile error because the date of birth is a init only property, meaning I can only set it when I'm initializing the object. If I did a public or sorry, var person equals new person, first name equals Joe, last name equals Quidagno, and that was it, and did not do line four, it would still fail. And obviously it would fail a little bit nicer with the next example. So here I'm making it a little bit clearer, whereas on line seven, I'm saying, yes, have a setter property that's init only, where if you don't have a value, throw a new argument null exception. That means if I had this code here, 
it would work fine, but if I eliminated line four, this code would catch it and throw an argument null exception. But in this case, I lose kind of the, uh, well, I'm not using a record, which is why you see that. Next up, let's take a look at top level statements. This one to me made absolutely no sense. But then I thought about it. It would help, and I think it really was built to help presenters. If you look at our typical code, if you're just doing a hello world, let's say you're trying to, to train someone or teach someone what C sharp is, and you want to do your basic console dot right line hello world. I have to write. Technically, it's not 12 lines, but I could probably do this in a little bit more without spacing everything. But a readable example, 12 lines, just to write console, hello world. What if the compiler figured all that out for you and you didn't have to worry about that? You only had to worry about this, the using system and console dot write line, hello world. You're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, that looks great, Joe, but why would I use that? How many times do I write a program that's just hello world? Well, you don't. This could be anything. So if you're writing a ASP MVC app, you have a startup class. You can write all that startup code right there in that one body without the whole namespace and having the different methods. Or you can even have separate methods for it, but just have your sub main, so to speak, as one line. You can even shorten it even more by just doing this and have a literal one line statement that sits some.console.write line. So to me, this is a little bit easier to read than this. What that means uh, right now, you can only have one one file in your solution with top level statements. Once it finds this, it assumes all the others are normal classes and breaks if they look like this. So I see this is gonna be used a lot in initial, in uh, startup kind of scenarios. So like in Azure functions or uh, MVC apps or maybe console apps where you're taking a couple of parameters and then calling off to something else. Adder matching is the next one. And Jim, I should ask you, how much time do I have? Can I finish or do you restrict to the finishing at seven? Uh, we're, we're not terribly strict it's about that. the time to wake up. <laughs> no, we're, we're not terribly strict about the time. So you can... uh, yeah, I probably got about another 15, 20 minutes. OK, pattern matching is um, this was introduced, I think, back in C sharp seven, maybe eight. Uh, the idea of pattern matching is to kind of get rid of a lot of weird switch statements in code or if this, then this or if this, if else, et cetera. So there's a couple of new pattern matching examples that came in. Uh, type matching, where they can match on type now. So it was this type of this. Uh, there's now parentheses are supported. There's and or supported. There's negative supported and relations. So let's take a look at a couple of different examples. So here's an extension method called is letter that works on a character class. Here it says if, or sorry, C is greater than or equal to lowercase a and is less than or equal to lowercase z, or the lowercase c is greater than or equal to uppercase a and is lower, less than or equal to uppercase z, then it's a character. And a little side bit for those of you who don't know, the reason why there's that or statement is because the characters in .NET Framework as well as .NET Core and now .NET are based on the ASCII chart. The ASCII, ASCII character system was 127 characters in the original, which is as big as uh, two to the fourth or fifth power, whatever it is. And there was a, a logical gap of other characters between the lowercase z and the uppercase a. 
So that's why you have to do the or here and can't just do from lowercase a to uppercase c. But with parentheses now, we can actually add to this. And for those of you that are a little bit more math inclined like me, this is a little bit easier to read because now you can say C is either greater than or equal to lowercase a and z or with the parentheses this. And then we added the extra ors at the end. So you can put parentheses in there to further clarify it. With type matching, you now have this, if person is not null. Now, I wish everyone had on their webcams now because you're probably all jumping for joy because I know with everyone at least, this is my favorite feature. No longer do I have to type to me, which was the one of the hardest things to get in the C-sharp language, the exclamation point equals to me, not equal to something to me, that made no sense. This to me, or especially if I'm giving it to someone that's newer, this makes a lot more sense. You're explicitly saying person is not null. So we can do a lot of that. And you can do comparisons to person is type, you know, teacher or student example. We also, or we, Microsoft also added source code generators. You're probably wondering what a source code generator is. Have you done any work in uh, any framework or some of the T4 templates? It's kind of what it is. C Sharp uh, source generators allows you to write code to write code. You're probably wondering, what does that mean? Uh, it, it actually gives you a mechanism to use the Roslyn analyzers to inspect the code and generate something out of it. So you can generate some of your POCO classes, you know, your C sharp objects, or you can generate boilerplate test cases by looking at your code samples. This allows you to generate code using the APIs that Roslyn uses to build your code. So this is going to, you can see a lot of third party products come out of this and things like ReSharper and CodeRush are going to start using this to help you generate templates going forward. Nullable annotations is also something that's new. Uh, now the entire .NET library is completely annotated. So that means you can turn on the what was introduced in C Sharp 8, which has your null checks on to see if you can try to capture those object not set to an instance of a variable or instance of a value errors. Now, while the whole library is annotated, the documentation is not. But you know, the .NET uh, documentation is also open source. So if you're feeling frisky and want to you know, write some documentation, because we all know how much developers love writing documentation. I spent a good chunk of this weekend, about six hours, just documenting one open source project I have. And it's just, it's rough. Anyway, so some of the C Sharp 9 features. Now, this is just a short list records, and it only setters, top level statements, pattern matching, source generators, and there's a lot more. You can read more at the link listed below. So not only were there C Sharp 9 features, there were some things added at PP, but you know, I do C Sharp, so that's what I talk about. There were three new tools that were released as part of the release, and I think all three of these will help people go through them. So I'll talk a little bit about them each individually. If you're not sure what a, a .NET tool is, these are used off the .NET command line. Uh, you can run those by doing .NET tool minus global and then whatever the tool name is. So if you want to do, if you want to install the .NET dash runtime info tool, you run from the command line .NET space tool space minus global space .NET dash runtime info. So let's talk about those three tools. .NET runtime kind of uh, extends your .NET framework to kind of tell you a little bit 
about your current environment. So here is a sample of me running on this laptop telling me that the version of .NET I have installed is declared as version 5. The description is .NET 5.0. Library's version is this. The hash is this. And then environment specific. So I am running this on a Windows machine running version 19042, and I'm using the X64 architecture and running 16 processors. If I was running this on my Mac, you would see the Mac OS description as you know, Mac, whatever am I, I think it's Big Sur now, whatever the version numbers, X64 architecture and probably eight processors because that's what my Mac has. So this is pretty good at kind of figuring out your runtime and checking to see what the latest version that you're executing on. The next tool is API port. Now what you're seeing is a snapshot of me running it on one of my open source tools. Uh, this part here, which list is done while you're executing it kind of shows you a mini progress bar. But the purpose of this tool is to look to see if there's any problems in porting your application to .NET 5. There are some exceptions on some things it doesn't work with, uh, but for the most part, it can check anything from .NET Framework 4 all the way up to .NET Core 3.1, as well as Mono and a couple others. It requires a compiled uh, assembly, so it could be a .NET DLL or it could be an EXE to run. And then this here is just the command line I used to run it. It generated the following API uh, report for it. So it ran against this assembly. So it's with Diagno as your helper storage version 1.1.2. And it found out that it's 100% compatible when I was running the .NET 3.1 version, uh, which is through platform extensions. Actually, I actually have to get rid of that. That was actually for a build. Uh, but it runs on 3.1, and 89% of what I do will work on .NET 2. So if I clicked on here, I would see the APIs I'm calling that might not work on .NET 2. In this particular case, it's nothing. It's a false positive. So it's a good way for you to look to see if your application can port over without any trouble. And if you really want to move forward with porting, you can do the try convert tool. Try convert tool will take a .NET core application as well as a .NET framework application and actually try to port it over. It'll run, make sure APIs are working. If there's any known APIs that are incompatible, we'll flag those. But it's a good way to get you that you know 80 percent of the way there, and in some cases can get you a full 100 percent. There's a couple of caveats to it. The doesn't support project types for Xamarin Web Forms or WCF projects. So if you have a WinForm app or a console app, it's a good first way to try and convert the app. Another big feature, which was not sure if it was added in uh, .NET Core 3.1 or if it, it's new in .NET 5, but system.text.json. So Microsoft tried to replace everything in newtonsoft.json, which is, you know, has been the de facto JSON library for .NET development and incorporated as part of the .NET ecosystem. Uh, and they even hired the creator of it, James Newtonsoft, to, uh, to work on it. A couple of things that they added to it, uh, there's now a, some HTTP client extensions. So they have a couple of extensions like get as JSON, get as, or put as JSON, post as JSON, pretty much all the HTTP verbs. They have extension methods now that will do the serialization or deserialization. There's support for records already built in. 
This is probably one of my favorite ones. There's better support for dictionary key value. So right now, uh, the original version only supported keys being a string and values being anything else. Now you can have the keys be integers or any other .NET, uh, any other .NET reference type. And then there's support for fields, which was actually a community contribution. They called this out. Uh, someone within the .NET community built it out, wasn't editing for Microsoft. And this one's a good feature, one of the limitations that keeps some people from being able to move to system.txt.json is how it handles self-referencing objects. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have a manager and employee object that's in the same table, well, they kind of point to each other, like I am a manager and I have a person that reports to me in the same table that is a manager, Joseph, but Joseph also has client references, and then you get to this, you know, nonstop secular secular reference. They've fixed that within uh, system.json. And then performance, they've optimized it. It's 20 to 50% more performant than Newton's uh, JSON was now. And if you actually go to the previous uh, URL, you'll see some of the performance numbers on it. Also focused on uh, deployments, trying to make it easier. They now have the concept of single file applications. So you can just deploy a single exe and don't have to worry about copying over 15, 20 files. Everything can be one exe. Right now, this only runs in Unix, I believe, or in Linux environments, and they're getting it to work on Windows. They added support back for click once now. So now you can create clicks once applications for anything built in .NET 5. Getting up with the cloud native approach, we're getting more cloud native, they introduced better support for REST APIs. They now support the open API. When you do a build a file new uh, ASP MVC app, they will build the Swagger open API files for you. And now when you run an API, you won't get, no longer get that, uh, you know, resource not found. It'll automatically redirect the project to this index page that shows your API while you're testing. And then they also have built in support to generate clients for you. So it can generate your uh, C sharp Windows form app or uh, web based applications for it too. There's also now support for gRPC, which is Google's remote procedure call. Kind of a replacement for WCF, it allows you to write smaller, faster, um, execute, executable code that runs on the server, but it doesn't run the same way as REST. And there's a whole blog post on it if you go to the URL below. Uh, made a lot of improvements to cross-platform development. You know, if you're using a lot of cloud-based development, it's cheaper and faster usually to run on Linux. So they've added more support locally for you to test with the Windows subsystem for Linux and Linux on your local desktop. Again, I mentioned the smaller single file apps for hosts like Azure Functions or AWS. Then they implemented uh, YARP, which is yet another reverse proxy. This one, I don't really understand what it does, uh, but Apparently, there are a lot of people at Microsoft inventing their own, so Microsoft decided to release one. This is a way to kind of call an API, and then the API figures out where to go. And that's pretty much all I have. Uh, originally, this slide said, one more, attend the .NET Conf that happened last week, but now they have all their YouTube, all their videos posted on YouTube at .NET Conf. I will leave it open for you with any questions you may have. My contact information is there. Uh, feel free to reach out for any other questions, anything that popped up afterwards.
but I'm here for any questions or for all walking down to the bar for a drink afterwards. No way, we can't do that right now. Oh, I wish we could. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> any any questions before? Uh... I must have been really that good. I, I covered everything. I think right. that he covered a lot. It was a very, uh, very good explanation of the transitions. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm really glad to hear. I'm sort of catching up with where .NET's gone, and it's obviously uh, moving quickly. Yeah. And the C sharp too. Yeah, yeah, definitely appreciate that. Uh, I was thinking that we were going to have somebody like next month to come talk specifically about C sharp, but uh, you you got a good overview right there, so that was awesome. I'm sorry to take away your next speaker. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's it's fine. We haven't scheduled anyone yet. So. <laughs> Is the recording going to be uh, linked that linked to in the meetup or? Yes. Okay. I'll I'll make that available on uh, YouTube and and uh, put the link in meetup if that's all right. Yep. Well, that's great. Just tag me when you post it on YouTube so I can help. You know. Yep. Broadcast it out. Did I miss the meeting? <laughs> no, it's just about to start. Okay. <laughs> hey, Don. We right. got it recorded for you, so. All right. Hey. Darren, you're ringing. <laughs> All right. So, well, I, I guess it uh, doesn't sound like there's any other questions or comments or. Oh, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, so for .NET 5, like, is VB.NET dead? Um, no, what about? No, not at all. Not at all? Nope, it's still live in there. There, I, I mentioned it on the C Sharp 9 slides. I focus on, you know, I do C Sharp mostly, so I didn't talk about VB or VB.NET, but there's VB.NET had features added, F Sharp did, as well as C. I highlighted the C Sharp stuff because that's in my wheelhouse, but VB is still alive and well as well as F Sharp is. Okay. And I probably uh, should have added my slides. No, I was just curious because, you know, going forward, if people had to rewrite nope. a bunch of code. Uh, as I think VB and C Sharp will be around for ever. I don't think Microsoft would ever get rid of VB. Would not be in their best interest considering probably half, more than half of their uh, customers use it still, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me right, right up there along with that slide about, you know, is .NET Framework dead? Um, really starts making me think about the Monty Python skit, you know. <laughs> Not dead yet. <laughs> I think I'll go for a walk. <laughs> yep. Sorry, I couldn't resist. You know. Just resting. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's too much, you know, there's too much infrastructure built on that to let it go. It's it's kind of like um uh at some level, a little bit like COBOL, um, you know, it's it's still out there. There's still tons of it in use. And, you know, if you know it, you make a good good living, you know, working with it. So, um, you know, something to keep in mind as far as that goes. So. But remember, they did let VB go. So yes. precedent for doing it. Yeah, they let Windows Phone go too, so there is a that's a point. <laughs> it's true. I mean, they in theory could. I don't know why they would at least any time soon. I think VB went because they moved to the whole .NET thing. But I mean, they still support Fox Pro now. Fox Pro hasn't had a production release for ten years, fifteen years now. Something like I'm that. I'm surprised it was that recent. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, they could have done it differently with VB, um, but they got they wanted a big break, I guess. Um, and the interactive environment that VB was, that the interpreter that it was, was going to slow it down. I, I, I am not going to disagree with you. I originally started as you know when I first started dabbling in programming, I was doing. Um, Quick basic for DOS and moved into VB and did VB6 up until I, when .NET first came out. I'm like, I'm going to try this going forward. But I didn't really stop doing VB6 for a good two or three years into .NET. It was really powerful and still is. Oh, yeah. Same for me. I, I you know, uh, various customers wanted VB still. Absolutely. I mean, there's still lots of people that, that do it. I know I see someone from your neck of the woods, you know, Julie Lerman, that still has clients that do VB and or Fox Pro that she still helps with. It's hard to go and change things, especially for systems that have been, you know, built 10, 15 years ago, that there's really no need and it's not, it doesn't cost justified to go and update it. Now, well, I have a customer who, I didn't work on VB or anything. I was working on SQL strictly, but they still had a VB6 program. Yep. I, I'll raise my hand. Um, I, I was just curious too about Entity Framework EF. Is that still alive? Will that be going forward too? So there is a EF. Are you talking about any framework, the 4.6 version or EF core? Ah, oh, got me there. Uh, well, you mentioned Julie's name, and I was just wondering if Entity Framework is still. So the any going forward, any framework core is the go to. There's still the, I guess, any framework original or classic. I don't know what they call it. That is there but that's no longer really supported going forward everything's using ef core and right now they're up to ef core 5 that got released when dotnet 5 got released and it's all the same stuff just you know kind of rebuilt and they rebuilt any framework into any framework core five or six years ago okay starting a new project that uses blazer and ef core 5 so I'll let you know how it works out. <laughs> My understanding is that there's they're very similar and interchangeable to some extent, but there are certain things that you had to manually do in the old version of Entity Framework that you no longer have to manually do in EF Core. That hey, lots of performance improvements. I used EF4, which had an EDMX file, and that completely disappears. Yep. They went more towards the either code first or you declare it. But in either case, everything's done with classes now and no longer that complicated XML diagram that you went and changed once and every one of your lines moved. And if you're like me, you spent <laughs> an hour just fixing the line so that it made sense just to add that one field. Yeah, that's what I had to do. <laughs> Okay. Well, if any questions pop up, oh, she has another one, Patty. I do. Um, how would uh, .NET, .NET 5 tie in with uh, Visual Studio versions? So uh, is it like 2019 yeah. and going forward? So right now, if you install 2019 version 16.8, I believe it is. That installs .NET 5 for you, and that has the full-on support of .NET 5. And that release happened last Tuesday. Ah, OK, thank you. But Visual Studio Code already supports it. JetBrains, Rider, if you use that, supports it, too, in the latest versions. Or you can just download the SDK and do it via command line too. OK, 
Okay. Well, if any other questions pop up, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or emails on the stream on the screen. If you want to learn more, you can go to aboutjjg.me. That's my site, as well as you can pick up the PowerPoint slide or catch me on Twitch, where I stream three times a week, typically. Awesome. If you have questions or feedback, yeah. feel free to reach out to Jim or myself and let me know. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hopefully, I'll come back again. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate it. You no worries. Have a great day, all. All right, and and uh, you too. Stay cool. <laughs> <laughs>